Hi, my name is Aniara Matthews, and I'm the Research Services Librarian for the Douglas and Henry Academic Centers. Um, today, February 1st, marks the beginning of Black History Month, and Mercy University Libraries is proud to celebrate this month on behalf of our students, faculty, and staff. Today, I'm joined here with Chester, Dr. Chester Fontenelle, who is the Baptist Professor of English and the Director of the Africana Studies Program here at Mercy University. And I'm also here with Myron Randall, who is the Student Success Coordinator at the Douglas Academic Center. And today, we'll be discussing the experiences and history of Black students and faculty um, within the space of education. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. I'm excited to be with you. Thank you for the invite. And I'm glad to be with Dr. Fontenot, too. I've heard great things. And to sit down and have a conversation with him and you is a very exciting thing for me. Well, it's good. I'm, I'm glad to be here, too. And and uh, the, I did all the great things that those other things I, I don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my first question is, how have Black people made a space for themselves within education, even throughout slavery and Jim Crow? I'm going to well, let you take that one, Dr. Fontenot, first. Okay. Well, during slavery, uh, education was uh, perceived as um, uh, the entry point for freedom. Uh, when you look at, for example, Frederick Douglass and his narrative, uh, you know, he talks about being educated and learning to be being educated. And when he says he did that, he felt like he was a free man, even though he was still a slave. Um, and all through our slavery, uh, the, the documents we have uh, indicate that there was this real drive for uh, you know, for education, and this, of course, the drive for education for Black folks was against the the white supremacist uh, system uh, that maintained that um, uh, Black people don't need to be educated. Um, furthermore, they can't be educated because they're not smart enough, you know, to be educated. Uh, but also, there was a threat that if Black people were educated uh, during slavery, that they could um, uh, not only um, rebel, you know, and organize, you know, rebellions, etc. But also, they didn't have to believe what uh, they were being told by white supremacists, they could uh, think for themselves, you know, and read and, you know, etc. And so during slavery, I mean, education, the push for education uh, was a push literally for humanity, you know, to be to be whole people, etc. Uh, and then after slavery ends, um, uh, the whole drive for education was then uh, to be upwardly mobile. Um, and so we have, uh, you know, uh, a whole generation that has this intense drive, this intense desire for education. Um, and then there, all these schools started to pop up in the South um, with the uh, uh, Freedmen's Bureau, you know, uh, act. And then a bunch of uh, school teachers came down from Boston, Massachusetts, funded in part uh, mostly, in fact, by the uh, Congregationalist uh, uh, denomination and established what was called the free schools, you know, throughout the South. We had some right here in Macon, Georgia, right outside of Macon. Uh, and some of the buildings, in fact, still stand there. Uh, some of them are, have been declared uh, national, uh, you know, historic places, and some of them have yet have yet to be declared as that. Uh, and so uh, Booker T. Washington, in fact, in his autobiography, Up From Slavery, says um, uh, after slavery ended, you know, this whole push for education was like a whole race was going to school at the same time, no matter what age, you know, uh, people, uh, you know, going to school, you know, et cetera. And so uh, education in terms of racial uplifting, this was the term that was being used at that time by black leadership. Uh, we have to uplift ourselves, racial uplifting. What do we do to be uh, for racial uplifting? Education had to be an education of a number of types. So we had Booker T. Washington with industrial education. So you need the education so you could work your farm, for example. You could uh, build bricks. You know, you could uh, uh, fix fix uh, fix things. You know, et cetera. Women education so that they could. Um, become better uh, managers of homes and uh, domestic arena and things like that. Um, and then you had the other side with du, du Bois and others, William Monroe Trotter, you know, et cetera, saying that wasn't good enough. We need was higher education, right? 
Uh, and so uh, we need to be able to compete and show these white folks that we can compete with them reading Plato and Aristotle and Shakespeare and Chaucer and, you know, and learning Greek and Latin and, you know, and all this. They're not better than us. And we're going to, you know, we're going to demonstrate that. A talented 10th uh, idea, huh? A talented 10th. That's mm -hmm. right. Exactly. You know, so education um, has been for people of African descent, the uh, entry point to uh, equality, you know, if, 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 if equality is on a hill, you know, uh, then education is right there at the bottom of that hill saying, okay, uh, you know, you need education or be able to climb this hill, right, et cetera. And this worked because by about 1915, 1916, um, the U.S. Census indicates that, uh, you know, in areas that were were uh, adjacent to the epicenters, the, the, the cities, you know, uh, throughout, especially the South and other areas, uh, roughly close to around 70, almost 71% of Black people self-identified as educated, literate. And literacy at that point meant you could read, write, and count, mm -hmm. right? Now, you go out to the very rural areas and you don't have that, right? But but uh, closer to... And so education has been the uh, has been the thing during segregation. Education, you know, was you know was it. Can I? I do want to add some more to this question, uh, and I want to back up a little bit and say I think this question is one of the reasons that we actually celebrate Black History Month, right? Because African Americans really have this uh, unusual story of perseverance. Uh, and survival in a place that was adversarial to them, mm -hmm. uh, especially when it comes to education, right? Uh, you were talking about by 1915, African-Americans identified themselves as educated. I mean, 75 years before that, there was a law in the books that said African-Americans can't read. That's right. uh, and to have that unusual persistence and say, nope, despite what we've been told and despite uh, what has been outlawed, we're going to do it anyway. Uh, right. So really, African-Americans have carved a niche, if you would, for themselves in learning how to read, how to write, how to become functional citizens in a democracy that really didn't want them as citizens. Uh, they saw themselves as a part of this country and the fabric of this country, even when the founders of this country did not see them as a part of the fabric of this country, they called them three-fifths of a person when exactly. they actually realized, hey, no, we're very whole uh, and we can do exactly what they can do uh, and stand exactly toe to toe and shoulder to shoulders with anybody else. Uh, and they did that through the vehicle of education when they learn to read, learn to write, and then learn higher order thinking skills and learn philosophy and, and Latin and Greek and those things, uh, which they were told that they would never be able to understand and comprehend. So uh, right. really just survival has mm -hmm. been tied to African-Americans carving a niche in educating themselves. Right. Yeah. Give you an example, then uh, you know I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, try to be quick at least. My father and mother uh, uh, were born and raised in uh, Louisiana, right? Uh, under one of the strictest, most inhumane forms of segregation in the, in, in the South. Okay? Well, uh, schools for Black folks only went to the sixth grade at that time. Okay? So my mother got almost as much education as was available to a black person during that era, okay? Mm -hmm. The early 1900s, okay? Uh, she, got, she went black person. My mother, my mother could read, write, and count, okay? My father, however, only was able to go to the third grade. Uh, you know, a lot of that had to do with, you know, uh, the area of town, area that he lived in, rural, et cetera. And the storms would come through, wash out the roads, and et cetera. The teacher that taught in the city could not make it to the country church, you know, where the, where the classes and stuff was held sometimes. So it took him like 10 years to get to a third grade and uh, because of that. And then when he finally got a third grade education, my grandfather said, there's enough, enough education, boy. You come out here in these fields and, and work with me. Okay. So when my parents moved to... Uh, uh, Los Angeles, uh, and, you know, where me and my sister and my brothers, you know, grew up, uh, my father couldn't read or write, right? And uh, my, I witnessed on documents that my father had to sign 
him making an X and my mother witnessing his signature. The greatest thing that my father thought that he was able to do, besides preaching, he was a, he, he was a minister also, was learn to read and write. And the people who taught him, and guess who taught him how to read and write? My sister and I. When we went to school, when we would leave in the morning, my father would say, okay, uh, go on to that school and learn something for me. And then when we come back, you know, and then that evening when he would come in, you know, and we doing our homework, he come up to us, he say, okay, now tell me what you learned. Show me what you learned. And through that, he learned how to read and write. Yeah. So, you know, you have this sense, this, you know, the drive that you were talking about, you know, and, uh, you know, there, the personal drive, you know, that, okay, you're being denied your humanity, right? Your right to really be a citizen out here, right? But my kids can learn, can read and write. So now I can learn, you know, to read and write. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a real tragic story for people of African descent and literacy. It really is. And, I, and let me add context to show you how egregious it is that African-American schools only went up to sixth grade, right? Mm -hmm. One, that's within a generation, right? So that's your dad and your mother. That's my grandmother and my grandfather. Mm -hmm. So it's literally within the generation, a touchable generation. Right. Uh, Harvard was founded in 1636. So right. Americans were here for 200 years and then realized we needed a very strong educational system uh, mm -hmm. and began to found very elite very rigorous universities all the way up into what UGA, which is in, in 1700s, right? So very right. much so uh, an educational place America was. Uh, but right. then there was this second class of citizen, if you would, that was right. denied access to all of this education that America had built. Right. So it, it really was an egregious thing to mm -hmm. not allow African Americans. And it was systematic and purposeful. Exactly. It was intentional. Exactly. That they were not allowed to read or write or have access to education in that way. And then you have the justifications like Thomas Jefferson notes on the state of Virginia, where he says these black folk can't do that anyway. You got it. You they got can't it. Think, they can't think higher you know, the, the, at the higher level. You know, Thomas Jefferson, the founder of the University of Virginia. Yeah. OK, right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. The signer, you know, the, the primary architect of the, of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Mm hmm. Said that in this magnificent document, notes on the state of Virginia, black folk. Uh, hmm. Yeah, yeah. I don't really have anything against them necessarily, but they just not equal. Yeah. Um. So my next question is: Why are historically black colleges and universities uh, so important for black students and faculty? And uh, what should they know about these institutions, even if they don't attend one or work at one? Right. I'll, I'll go here. I'll go first on this one. Uh, one, I love HBCUs. Now, I will give you a uh, warning here. I did not attend an HBCU. I did work at Morehouse for four years. I was the assistant director of admissions uh, at Morehouse uh, and absolutely loved it. My entire family went to HBCUs, primarily went to Southern University in New Orleans. I had one aunt who went to Grambling State, then became the president of Grambling State after she graduated many years later. Uh, oh. So HBCUs are a really special thing to my family uh, and a very special thing to me as well. I wanted to be a televangelist, so I went to or Roberts University, because that's where you go if you want to be a television, right. which is why I didn't be go to an HBCU. But uh, I feel like I had an HBCU experience when I went back to work at Morehouse. And I will tell you, they are very, very special places. Yeah. Uh, one, I, I pulled out some statistics from the United Negro College Fund just to kind of help illustrate that. So while HBCUs only make up 3% of all colleges in the United States, they're responsible for 20% of all the graduations for African-Americans in the United States. Mm -hmm. That rises to 25% uh, for African-Americans in STEM. 70% uh, of the students at HBCUs are Pell eligible, meaning that usually they're coming from first generation. They don't have the resources and the finances to pay for school out of pocket. Uh, mm -hmm. That's 70% of the student population at HBCUs. And then this one is a uh, random, but my favorite statistic. Um, they looked at Fortune 500 companies. Uh, and this one actually went down and dug deep to African-American females who are the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. There are only two. Uh, now, there are 500 companies in the Fortune 500. There are only two African-American females. 50% of those two uh, went to an HBCU. Roz Brewer 
who went to Spelman right down the street from us here uh, in Georgia. Uh, the other went to the University of Houston. Uh, but nonetheless, very special places. What I think they foster uh, is this ideal of seeing someone that looks like you achieving what you thought you could not achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, it is it's what they call the paradigm of the possible. Right. It switches your ideal to say, you know what? I didn't think I could do that, but then I see Bob doing that. And right. so I think I can do that too. Mm -hmm. I see a graduate of Morehouse doing that. So I think I'm going to try to do that too. Uh, and it gives you this aspiration and inspiration to reach a little bit higher than yourself. So I enjoyed my time there. It was a lot of fun. Uh, you also got to know yourself uh, as an African-American. You you found out what potential you had, mm -hmm. uh, what you could do, that you could read Chaucer, uh, that you could read the, the Jabberwocky uh, mm -hmm. and understand it and discuss it like others. Uh, so it was a really comforting. It was an exciting experience. Uh, and these are valuable resources to our nation that should be preserved. So, yeah. Amen. Here, here. You know, I've never taught at an HBCU. I didn't attend an HBCU. I, I'm, I'm from, I grew up in Los Angeles. There were no HBCUs in California, right? If there had been, I probably would have, you know, no one, but, you know, I came from what now young people call the hood, Compton, right? And I was just glad anybody wanted me to go to college. You know, I didn't, like, okay, okay, you want me? Good. You know, gonna give me some money, you know, fine, you know. So, um, but in the in the course of my career, I have been very close to uh, you know, the HBCU environment. Um, a lot of my friends uh, have uh, either currently work at HBCUs or have worked at HBCUs. I've I have given lots of lectures um at HBCUs. Um uh, and um uh, and so, you know, I'm kind of familiar with the environment from the, you know, kind of from a distance, not having worked, you know, at one. But, uh, um, all I can say about the value of an HBCU from somebody from distant is my high school was like an HBCU because I came through an era where black uh, um, intellectuals, uh, you know, uh, uh, teachers and stuff uh, could not teach at a white college. They go. They were only. I don't care how many de uh, degrees you had, et cetera. Uh, you could not teach at a at a predominantly white school, right? So, um, uh, my high school, we had um, the average teacher at my high school had a master's degree, and several had PhDs. You know, um, and so they were always driving us. You know, you know. Uh, I, I can remember. Uh, for example, this is before I went to high school and elementary school. I was in the uh, I was in the sixth grade. I'd had the same teacher for reading and, you know, I didn't know that kind of stuff. Um, uh, starting in the third grade until I went to the fifth grade, sixth grade, you know, then it was something else. I was in someone else's class or something else. I don't remember what it was. There was an election, um, student body election. And my friends and some teachers talked me into running for student body president, which I didn't want to do. OK, but they said, OK, no, you make a good student body president. We need you and all that. I would agree. I think you would probably were a great student body president. I'm hoping yeah, you yeah. would. Yeah. So in in doing that, however, you had to submit an essay why people should vote for you and what you're going to do. Right. You're student body president. So I wrote, you know, this essay. Uh, and of course, we didn't have typewriters and all that kind of stuff. Everybody didn't have that kind of stuff. You wrote it by hand, right? That kind of stuff, computers, anything like that. Turn it in. I'm sitting in class, in this in my class. All of a sudden, my teacher points to me and then points to the door. I thought I had, I thought she was kicking me out. I said, I didn't know what was going on. I hadn't done anything. So I turned around, looked at the door. My third grade teacher was standing at the door with the essay I wrote, holding it up like this. I walked outside and she said, come down to my classroom. I went down to her classroom. She sat me down, set that piece of paper down like that and said, I taught you how to write better than that. Your penmanship is horrible. Wow. Wow. You will not embarrass me and this school by writing like that. You're going to write until you get it right. 
And I sat there the entire class period writing over and over and over again until my penmanship satisfied her. That's the kind of thing you get mm -hmm. in a black educational environment. Now, they're not doing, I'm sure they're not doing that kind of thing in HBCUs with students, but that's the kind of thing that people have told me about where faculty have pulled them aside and said, uh-uh, uh-uh. No, 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 no. You will not do this. You will not do that. Okay. And so people have responded, uh, have told me, students who went to HBCU told me it's like you had a whole campus full of mamas and daddies. Absolutely. Uncles, aunts, Absolutely. grandparents. Yep. A whole community. Yeah. It's a culture of care. <laughs> you know yes. what it is? Yes. They care about their students. They want to see you successful. And that translated to the staff side. Uh, mm -hmm. even those staff that were mentoring younger junior staff like me would make sure mm -hmm. we were held accountable, that we did the work that we said we were going to do. I'll never forget, I went to a meeting, uh, and I'm going to call this gentleman's name, uh, Dean Darden. He was the dean of students there at Morehouse, uh, and I was helping out with the summer academy. Those were all the uh, students that would be on campus during the summer, whether for summer school or a summer camp or what have you. Uh, and I was running late to the meeting. I will admit that. I was running late to the meeting. I had just grabbed a pen and a piece of paper, and I ran to the meeting. Uh, I get to the meeting, and I, I just grab the, the little cheap Morehouse pen to write with in the meeting. I sit down, and I pull out my notebook. I pull out my pen. Dean Darden is kind of doing his introductory remarks, at which point he turns, and he looks at me, and he goes, you didn't come to this meeting on purpose. I'm thinking, what in the world does that mean? No, Dean, I did come to this meeting on purpose. He said, I know you didn't come because you got that cheap Morehouse pen. You didn't come here with any intention. <laughs> Don't come to my meeting with a cheap Morehouse pen. And I thought it was about the pen, but it really wasn't. He realized that I didn't prepare for that meeting. Right. I had just run out of the door and he could tell by the fact that I grabbed the cheapest, the easiest pen to find mm -hmm. that I was not prepared. Uh, and I knew never to ever come again unprepared to a meeting, especially a Dean Darden meeting, right? Yeah. Uh, which was now a, a, an institutional thing for me, right? I make sure that every meeting I go to, I am prepared. I am ready. I've got my notes. I've looked at the questions beforehand. I got a good pen and some good, decent paper to write with, right? So it's that culture of care. And then I'll say this last thing too. I want to, HBCUs taught me that my culture is okay. Mm -hmm. uh, that it is okay. You know, African-Americans have a unique culture, whether it's gospel music and black church culture, or it's it's mm -hmm. the football culture with the big bands and then the uh, right. the divine nine and fraternities, uh, that culture is okay. And we celebrated that culture and it was okay to live into that culture. And you didn't have to uh, homogenize yourself with anything else. You could be who you were as an African-American and that was okay. And then you took that strength into the world and you realize it was okay to be you in whatever space you went into outside of an HBCU. Right, right. And that is what we miss being at predominantly white institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we there's a part of us, a big part of us, that we have to suppress. Yeah. In order to succeed at predominantly white institutions, right? But at an but at HBCUs, that part that we suppress at white institution is normalized. Yep. It's okay. You know, it, it, I mean, it, it's 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 okay for a Falcon member to go to homecoming game and lose their minds like the students, you know, and, you know, everybody jumping up and down and shouting and carrying on and, you know, yelling out. Uh, that's okay. So uh, uh, to be in an environment where you are normal is a unique experience for Black people. Mm -hmm. It's the only time we can be normal when we're that HBCUs and the Black church. Sure enough. The only two sure times that we can be normal yeah. Oh. Yeah. My next question is, since the ruling of Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, has it been easier for Black learners to access to quality education? Well, um, to say easier is a loaded term. I uh, agree. I agree. My because we couldn't get that. We could not access it at all before. <laughs> Brown versus Board of Education. I mean, there was one that slipped in over here, one slipped in over there, but large, but but African Americans as a whole were denied before Brown versus Board of Education. You see, um, so uh, uh, and you had this, uh, you know, this uh, separate but equal thing with Plessy versus Ferguson that Booker T. Washington um, 
who had good intentions, I believe, you know, he just didn't know that they were, you know, uh, uh, that the uh, white supremacist um, governments, uh, legislatures and all that, were not going to fund black schools the same way they funded white schools, right? And so it became separate but unequal, right? And so now you had, you know, a, a ruling that said, no, you got to treat black folks like, you know, like white people being treated, you know, et cetera, and, and uh, let them in to environments, let them into institutions, educational institutions that you've been previously keeping them out of. Uh, so uh, to say that that was easier, no, because the first uh, uh, young people who came through the doors as a result of uh, uh, Brown versus Board of Education had to come through with uh, National Guards. That's not easy. Little kids coming through Little Rock, Arkansas. You got Little, Little Rock kids. Nine. No, yeah, coming through, going to school, surrounded by National Guards with white supremacists throwing stuff at them and yelling and threatening them and all that kind of stuff. Um, it opened the door, but it wasn't easy, right? Um, I maintain that even to this day, it has gotten easier to get in to, you know, environments, integrated environments, predominantly white institutions and stuff like that. Um, but it is still um, stressful, uh, problematic, and uh, psychologically debilitating to a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of people of African descent. Um, and it's scary for a lot, you know? I mean, especially if you come from a predominantly Black environment, you know? And then all of a sudden you come and all these white people, you know, and it's, yeah, and you're a minority, you know, we do better here at Mercer. We have almost 30% students of African descent on this campus and on the uh, Macon campus. Um, but still, it, but, but even with that, we still have situations where black students enrolling in classes are the only one in that class or maybe one of two. You know, they'll, they'll link up with a couple of their friends and say, let's take this class, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, um, even today, it is uh, easier kind of quote, quotations around it uh, to go through the door. But once you get through the door, uh, you face some challenges in terms of, uh, you know, uh, of, of education. Yeah, I agree with you. I think easier is the issue in that question there. I think increased opportunities, right. I wouldn't necessarily say easier opportunities, right? right? It is uh, it's still very difficult and it, for all the reasons that Dr. Fontenot mentioned. Uh, but yeah, it, it definitely increased opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, we see those opportunities increasing more and more. Uh, but then, you know, it's, it's interesting. American society is like a pendulum. Uh, you know, sometimes we swing forward and then we swing a couple of steps backwards. So while it is it is increased, sometimes uh, it decreases just a little bit, then maybe increases a little bit more. So we we see that pendulum kind of go back and forth, especially what in the last four years, previous administration, we saw a decreased educational opportunity. I'm just gonna call yeah. a spade a spade. There are numbers to say that. Okay. Uh, so it's it's a pendulum to some degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it kind of it kind of goes in waves. Yeah. Uh, in waves. So my next question is, what has been your experience in education, either as a student or as a faculty or a staff member? Yeah, that is, that's a loaded question, right? I yes. don't know where to start with that. I was in the first group of Black students in 1968 who were admitted to predominantly white uh, institutions. Throughout this country, just about every predominantly white institution has a story about the class of 1968. Some even have uh, monuments you know, to them right here at Mercer, you know, we celebrate the almost every, almost every year, every other year, right? Uh, and I was in that class, 1968, right? And we came to campus. Let me, let me just give you one example, and then I'm going to turn it over to, you know, because I, I can talk about this for a long time, but I'm writing a book about it. Let's put it that way, okay? My experiences. Uh, I was a basketball player. A pretty good, a very good basketball player. I, I got a basketball scholarship to go to college. Right? And the college I went to was a Quaker school, Whittier College. That wasn't unlike Mercer. Man, uh, you know, 
religiously affiliated, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and um, uh, liberal, uh, much more, it was more, it was more liberal than Mercer in, in many respects, uh, although Mercer had become more liberal recently. So uh, I get admitted. I show up at, um, Mer at uh, Whittier along with about 70 other, 70, 75 other uh, black guys and about 17 black girls, women. Uh, all but about six or seven of the black guys were athletes, football, basketball, baseball, track. Okay. Uh, on campus, there was, um, we had, like I said, over 100 black guys. We had 17 black women, so there was nobody to date. Unless you went back home. You know, if you want to date a black girl, right? That kind of thing. Um, so we all hung together. We were, you know, nervous, right? We were scared, man. You know, at predominantly white school in Orange County that had a history of racism and, you know, and anti-blackness and all that kind of stuff. We all hung together, right? We go to movies together. We go to eat together. We, you know, uh, uh, walk down the street together, right? But one evening, we decided we were going to go to a movie to see what the college, little college town area right outside the campus, what that had to offer. Yeah. So it was probably about 25 or 30 of us uh, we started walking off of campus on the sidewalk and this policeman, uh, we got maybe half a block and this policeman saw us, turned the corner, came up and got out of his car. And he said, uh, you must be athletes at the, uh, at the university, right? We said, yeah, we are. Uh, he said, I'm going to do you a favor because it's not safe for you out here uh turn around walk back to the campus and i'm going to follow you and make sure you get on campus safely and he turned his car around and inched along as we walked back to the campus and he sat right there on the edge of the campus and watched us walk up into the campus far enough that he was satisfied that we were safe and then he turned around and went on it was a dangerous period for black young for black folk coming to these schools, you know, predominantly white schools. Uh, we were not welcome. No, at all. We were not welcome. I mean, there are horror stories about what happened here in Mercer. And so uh, the story of black in higher education, particularly at predominantly white institutions, uh, is emblematic of the struggle that we've had to uh, uh, would go to just to be whole people, you know, to get a college degree, you know, and, you know, to to be able to uh, stand next to the white folk and say, I, you know, you're not better than me. You know, I, 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 I've got mine, you got yours, you know, et cetera. It's, it's been a struggle, right? And a lot of black folk didn't make it. The, the attrition of black people who came in during that era was extremely high. Fell by the wayside because many could not take that kind of pressure that was um, that was on us. You see? So uh, it was a. Um, uh, some people say, "Oh, you know, it was that dynamic period." It was a scary period. Hmm. If you lived through it, you know, it was scary. It was, yeah. I don't have fond memories. Of that era, I mean, and some of my uh, uh, peers, in terms of age, you know, and everything who came through during that era, and they didn't talk about this like it was some rosy period. And I have to stop them and say, oh, "What's where'd you go to school? <laughs> You're the first one I've heard that have fond memories of coming into these white institutions in 1968. They had no place else to live, for example." Before I came here, I was at the University of Illinois and uh, in Champaign-Urbana. Okay? Uh, they admitted 500 Black students uh, in 1968. When students got there, they had no place for, on campus for them to live. They put the 500 Black students up in the gymnasium on cots 
And the black folk in the community found out about it and said, oh, no, uh -uh, that's not working. And they organized through the churches, et cetera, and they adopted black students into their homes and families. Here in Mercer, we talk, there, there are stories of black folks here at Mercer coming in 1968, living with families off campus, even Sam Oney. You know, we talk about the first black student to graduate and all that kind of stuff. Sam, a good friend of mine. Sam talks about how black folk took him. So uh, uh, it was a real troublesome era. You know, uh, the, the thing about being a trailblazer and uh, all that, you know, uh, people say, oh, he was a trailblazer. The person was trailblazers come out with a lot of scars, a lot of wounds that nobody sees. You know, uh, because you are creating a path and then you're walking it at the same time. No, so I'll leave it to you. You know, I can go on and on about this. So. Well, listen, first of all, I got to back up and say, you know, I am I've, I've got chills hearing you tell this story. So before I say anything, I want to say thank you. Uh, because you are the shoulders that I stand on uh, mm -hmm. going to a white institution, right? I, you really, I, trailblazer is the word. I wish I could find uh, the tip of the spear, maybe, right? Even a better terminology, but thank you for that. I, I really thank you for telling us that story as well. Uh, you know, there's that quote that said that they walked so that we could run. And sir, you are uh, part and parcel of that. So thank you very much. Because, um, yeah, that gives me chills to hear. And I will say this, um, what I learned in my experience as a student, and I, again, went to a predominantly white institution in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, and Oklahoma is the middle of nowhere, folks. Um, you know, right. wind goes blowing on the plane. That's all that's there is the plane. It's plain. Mm -hmm. uh, is that culture shock is real. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this thing called the stages of culture shock. You know, you go through the honeymoon phase, and then mm -hmm. after the honeymoon phase, what is it? It is the, um, the distress phase. That's what it's called, mm -hmm. where you mm -hmm. walk around and you go, oh, my God, I'm the only one that looks like me here. Mm -hmm. these people talk a different language than me they right. think differently than me mm -hmm. you realize how different you are mm -hmm. in relation to the culture that you're in right. uh and so i experienced that when i went to college as well uh so um, it is it's culture shock is real that's all i'm gonna say about that uh right. now when i begin to work at higher education <laughs> when i begin to work at morehouse uh a very nurturing environment uh and then when i got to to mercer i was able to use what i learned at morehouse here and I think one of the reasons I've been successful here at Mercer uh, and have had a tenure, I've been here for about eight years, uh, a tenure this long is because Morehouse prepared me, even though I wasn't a student, I was a staff member, prepared me to do what I do here at Mercer very, very well. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. My next question is, um, so in many cases, being one of the few or the only Black student or faculty member uh, on a predominantly white campus, because sometimes feel lonely or even scary. Like, what advice would you give them so that they can continue their educational journey, like at these institutions? You know, I would say that your voice matters. Uh, to know that you are there on purpose, you are there with a reason, and not to silence yourself because you look different than the folks that are there. I'll never forget in college, uh, and uh, I don't even know this guy's name anymore. He uh, had a quote on his wall. Uh, and I never really understood the quote. I memorized it because it was it was lyrical. And it said, one must fight with all his might not to assimilate to those that are his brothers. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't know where that came from. I Googled it. I don't know who said that. Uh, but it's this idea that, one, we realize that humanity is, is a brotherhood, that we are all inextricably linked. Uh, but the biggest fight of your life is to realize that yes, you're in a brotherhood with humanity, but you are different than all of your brothers. Uh, and you have got to use your own voice and you've got to use your own consciousness and you've got to use everything that is built uh, in you and be you and then present that to the world because the world needs you. Uh, and so to those African-American students who are in places where they feel isolated or by themselves, you need to know that you're important there. That all those, Folks at the table need your voice probably more than the other voices because the other voices are going to sound just like theirs. Uh, and so in the words of Clarence Thomas, oh, right, <laughs> diversity is a compelling interest in governmental <laughs> affairs. Uh, <laughs> diversity is important uh, yeah. and it must be preserved at all costs. So you're important and your voice matters in those spaces. Yeah. But uh, the sense of loneliness and isolation for 
uh, black faculty uh, and sometimes black students is very real. Uh, and it gets even more intense for black women um, at predominantly white institutions. Right here in Mercer, for example, we've had trouble um, trying to keep black fa female faculty uh, because they feel so isolated, right? And while me, I and a couple other black faculty members here, uh, they're in the math department, the black guys, we eat lunch together and, you know, got a little group, you know, that kind of stuff. We invite them, well, why don't you come eat lunch with us? You don't have to stay, stuff like that. But then they let us know, okay, well, we can do that. But you guys are guys. You're men. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you know, you don't know what we're going through as black females, you know, where, you know, we walk in class and we got students disrespecting us, you know, because we're our colleagues not taking up for us, you know, beckoning us, you know, the, the racist and the sexist crap, you know, that they're, that they're having to deal with. I'm very, I'm very aware, you know, of, uh, you know, of that. Uh, so what I advise uh, um, students to do first uh, is to uh, look for uh, like-minded people and, and see if there are groups that you can become part of, join. Now, a lot of Black students solve this by, by, by going to the Divine Nine. You know, they, yeah, they, and then they, they okay, they, they, they've solved that. They're no longer lonely. They're no longer, you know, out there feeling like they are a uh, pariah, you know, and, and unwelcome, you know, and all that. Uh, uh, others uh, resolve it in, in, you know, in, in other ways, okay? Uh, for faculty, I advise to uh, uh, find like-minded people um, who are supportive and try to form relationships, you know, with them. This is what I did. I mean, I was the first Black person uh, when I got my doctorate, I was the first black to get a doctorate from the institution that I got it from, University of California at Irvine, and only the fifth from the entire use of the University of California system. Okay. Uh, the first job I had was at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. I was the first black faculty member who had ever been hired there. And I was young on top of it. Right? So uh, here I come into an environment where I'm the first black faculty member, right? I'm young, I'm a lot younger than the other faculty, you know, there, I was in my twenties, okay? And, uh, and third, uh, I'm in a whole different part of the country that, sound, that looks, to, you know, uh, look, look, looks like they shot me to the moon or something. Coming from LA to Nebraska, really? Okay? And so what, what helped me was I opened myself to well-meaning, white faculty uh, who really did care about me, right? Now, some of them could care less. You know, they thought they probably would have, you know, wish I wasn't there. But there were some who did care, right? And uh, they kind of ushered me along, you know, uh, uh, you know, helped me. Uh, uh, and so I have good memories, good feelings about my time in Nebraska. Those were nice. They were that. People were just treating me nicely, okay? Really nice, right? And I did not feel isolated. They made sure I did not feel isolated. They went overboard to make sure I did not feel out. But I think some of that had to do with the fact that I was open to that. I didn't just sit off in my corner and say, oh, they're on a, oh, they have the black faculty here. You know, a lot of faculty that I know, um, including black women, uh, I have a very close friend that's now at the University of Houston, director of African-American studies there, she's a woman. Um, and, uh, the way she has dealt with it is, um, uh, she's very involved in church. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, I can't call her and we can't talk on Wednesday at seven o'clock at night because she's in prayer meeting. Yeah. But that's how she's dealt with the sense of being, you know, not having a lot of us around and, you know, and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, church, and then she also she's a Delta, so she got that she has that coverage. You see, so um, there there are ways to do it. 
I think the main thing is when things happen at an institution that you know uh, are, are injurious to people of African descent and people of color. You know that's not good. That's, not, that's a bad thing. How do you deal with it? Okay. Well, I had a leg up on it because when I was in graduate school, uh, getting ready to leave, graduate, one of the faculty members took me to lunch in the department. And he said, we're real proud of you, you know, showered all this stuff on me, you know, you're gonna do this, you're gonna be great and all that kind of thing, right? Uh, he said, but uh, uh, don't listen to people that want you to come in and, and all of a sudden straighten everything out that, you know, been wrong for all these years, right? Don't do that. Yeah, number one thing is, take care of you. Self, make sure number one that you get tenured you're permanent right or you have some some and you know, in the case of both of you who are staff you don't have tenure but you can be you can be around enough to get to to, to get some authority right to mm -hmm. uh to get some leverage right that kind of thing he said because once you're tenured and in your case been around long enough right you can do more in five minutes than you could walking in right off the cuff and, you know, uh, making all these demands. Yeah. Uh, make sure that you establish credibility over a period of time, right, with the institution. And then you can make some changes, you know, uh, there and push the envelope forward toward diversity and inclusion and all that, you see. Uh, that was the best advice anybody gave me coming out of graduate school. Uh, so my last question, um, so most university libraries has access to all kinds of resources. And based on this discussion, I recommend that students, faculty and staff uh, read this journal article um, titled The Blacks Who First Entered White Higher Education by Robert Bruce Slater. Um, and this article talks about uh, the first black students who attended college and graduated. Uh, what are some other resources you recommend one, I recommend this Zoom. Um, you all should watch this and rewatch it. Uh, but one book that I, I swear by, and I've already quoted it today, uh, Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum, former president of Spelman, wrote a book right. called Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Exactly. It's accessible. It's mm -hmm. easy to read. It gets to mm -hmm. the point. I recommend everyone read that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they read no more than her book. You, that's a good foundation, right? Yeah, that's yeah. a very good foundation. Well, we use it. I've used it. I've used her book here, right? Mm -hmm. it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, that was it. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Um, and for more information about the library, you can visit libraries.mercy.edu. Thank you.